Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I'm at the Rock Island Auction Company, where they've actually started uh, taking on some things a little bit bigger than the small arms that we're used to looking at. So I don't know that much about tanks. I'm going to leave this sort of thing to the people who do, namely Nick Moran, who is going to have some really cool videos of some of this sort of stuff coming up. So definitely make a point to check out his channel to see those. In the meantime, let's go back to our little cannon. So this is a Leichtes Infantry Geschütz 18. It is a German infantry, well, infantry cannon, uh, infantry gun. And it's one of the things that's really interesting to me is after World War I, in the aftermath, everyone, each country had its own ideas about, like, what did we do right, what did we do wrong in terms of military uh, material and tactics, and what do we need to do to prepare for the next war? Because for the perceptive folks out there, it really wasn't much of a secret that the Treaty of Versailles wasn't really a peace treaty. It was really like a 20-year ceasefire, and this conflict would come back, come roaring back, uh, obviously, in 1939. So uh, one of the things that the Germans took away from the end of World War I is that they needed a better sort of light infantry gun that they could, that, that was mobile. Uh, light, small, mobile. It didn't have to be super powerful but it needed to be flexible, and it needed to be a gun that could actually be uh, taken with the troops, something to bring up to the front lines to give infantry support. So if you had a strong point, not the Maginot line, but a pillbox, or an enemy anti-tank gun, or any sort of, sort of small enforced position that was something that couldn't be assaulted just by infantry small arms. It was outside of, say, light mortar range or rifle grenade range, and couldn't really be attacked with light machine guns. Well, you needed something to be able to engage a position like that. And the Germans felt they didn't have a sufficiently good weapon for that in World War I. So one of the first things they started developing after World War I was this guy. Uh, so development of this began in 1927 by the Rheinmetall firm. And Rheinmetall was doing small arms as well. This was kind of a sneaky way uh, for the German military to start doing arms development uh, in a way that that they could plausibly deny any violation of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, basically by doing this all through a subsidiary in Switzerland. So the gun was formally adopted in 1932. You'll note it has an 18 as in its nomenclature. It's the, the Leichtes Infantry Geschütz 18. And you see that with some of the machine guns that were being developed at the same time. They gave them names that made them sound like, oh yeah, we had this in World War I. We, this totally was a 1918 thing. We didn't actually just develop this, we just like only made a couple prototypes or something, and now we've decided to start making it. So we're not actually violating the treaty. Their machine nomenclature, machine gun nomenclature did this too. The MG-13, the MG-15, these were all 1920s designs. So um, the, in total this would be produced, uh, they would make about, about 12,000 of these between 1932 and 1945, and it was produced basically right up until the end of World War II. It was a pretty successful gun for the Germans. They liked it, it did what it was supposed to, you know, it may not have been cutting edge by the end of the war, but does it really need to be? It's still throwing high explosive, it still works, it's still easily mobile. So let's take a look at a couple of the, the functional bits. Unfortunately this gun is uh, welded shut, but it had a really unusual action and it looks strange. So let's see why they did that. So the action on this piece is really fairly unusual. It's, well, as you can see, it's this kind of weird boxy thing. And it actually functions rather like a break action shotgun. So the whole box is going to re recoil backwards when it fires, which is pretty typical just to absorb the energy of firing something like this thing. The, I, I should point out, the reason for that is uh, what you're trying to do is keep, is isolate the carriage. You want the carriage to stay in place so that uh, basically so that you don't have to completely recite the gun with every shot. Um, if you can have all of the energy absorbed by this thing coming back, that's the equivalent of a low recoil shoulder arm. Uh, at any rate, what happens after this recoils back is this front side of the breech block actually pops up, think of it like a break action shotgun, and spits the shell out. So the breech block here is fixed in place. Normally on a gun like this you would have the breech block dropping or sliding or rotating or in some way moving. In this case, again, like a break action shotgun, the breech is fixed and it's the barrel that actually lifts up to eject the cartridge. Then you can throw a cartridge in, slap it down uh, to chamber it, and then uh, you're ready to fire again. 
we have a traverse adjustment wheel right here. This has this is capable of 12 degrees of traverse side to side. And what's kind of interesting about this is if you see what this gun is doing, it's leaving the wheels in place and it's not actually rotating the gun itself. It's pivoting the entire trail and everything uh, on a screw on this axle. So the whole the wheels are staying and the whole gun is swinging side to side. Note the, the distance between the edge of the shield there and that wheel. And then if I bring it back over here, now we have the opposite. So that's kind of an interesting aspect. I should also point out while we're back here, you'll see this relatively frequently on gun shields. This kind of curly uh, scalloped surface to the shield. The idea there is to avoid hard straight lines and to make the gun easier to camouflage. How effective that was, I'm not sure because you don't have to get very far away before it looks like a straight line, but it is something that was done here as well as on other guns. Now the elevation wheel is over on this side. This has a pretty substantial uh, range of elevation. You can go all the way down to zero, basically just point shooting, direct fire. And they did actually make an anti-tank, uh, a shaped charge or a hollow charge uh, shell for this. Apparently, by all accounts, it wasn't all that effective, especially towards the end of World War II, um, but it was an option. Most of the time this would be used with high explosive, which you could use direct fire, or you could angle this guy up quite a lot more. Um, maximum effective range was about 4,000 meters. That's not bad. This was firing about a 12 pound uh, explosive projectile. That's five and a half to six kilos. One of the cool bits is the armor shield on the front when you elevate this. Let me show you. So there is actually a little piece of armor shield underneath the gun barrel itself. And the idea is, you know, you want to protect the, sh the, the gun crew from fragments, maybe bullets. This is fairly light stuff, mostly fragments. But, you know, you need to have the gun be able to pivot all the way down to direct fire. But then when it comes all the way up, you don't want to have this big open hole in your shield. So they built this cool articulated pivoting gun shield section. Check this out. Neat, huh? So there were a couple variations made on this. You can see that this one still has the old style of wooden spoke wheels. Uh, some of these would get upgraded with modern metal and rubber tired wheels. Um, remember though that when World War II began, a lot of the German military was still horse drawn and not mechanized. So if you're towing this behind some horses, these wheels are just fine. Uh, and they're also lighter, by the way. Uh, the whole thing weighed right just under 900 pounds, that's about 400 kilos. That's about what you would expect for a light infantry gun that could actually keep up with the infantry. One cool thing about this guy is that it is extremely well balanced. So I can pick this thing up. That's, <laughs> it's a little worse balanced when the gun's all the way pivoted up, but this thing is really easy to lift up at the back and move around. Now, if that's not good enough, they did also, uh, later on, in 1935, they came out with a Mountain Troops version of this gun. It actually weighed more. What they did was take this kind of box frame uh, trail and replace it with a tubular metal trail. It weighed more, but it broke down into like, I think, 10 pieces uh, for transport, and the heaviest single piece was 75 kilos. That's still heavy, but that's at the point where maybe one really strong dude um, can carry that 75 kilogram piece for a while, but it'd be easy to put on horse, on very small vehicles, oh, yeah. tow it in a cart. It, it makes the gun a lot more easily transportable, um, if nothing else for hauling the thing up, uh, you know, stiff, steep mountain trails, whatever. So uh, they did also have that mountain version. A um, couple other statistics I should point out on this. Rate of fire, the practical rate of fire was 8 to 12 rounds per minute. That is, of course, including aiming, if you were just going to try and blow ammo through it as fast as you could, I suspect you could get more than that. But practical rate of fire, 8 to 12 rounds a minute. 
And uh, as I said, it ran all the way through World War II. It was eh, not the newest piece of technology, but it was reliable, it was effective. Um, that weird tilting barrel action didn't really have any particular advantage, but it didn't really apparently have any real disadvantage either. Um, maybe different for the sake of being different, but hey, if it works, it works. So we have kind of a cool bit of suspension here. These cylinders are in fact the suspension for the wheels. So uh, the axle comes into here, and then you have what I assume, but I haven't actually pulled it apart to look, is a, a torsion spring in here, and then the wheel is actually attached on the end of this arm that comes out. So when this thing is going over bumps, the wheels can articulate like that. All right, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. It's not often really that we get to take a look at artillery pieces, kind of the, the cannons and the bigger infrastructure, but these have as much of a part in military history as small arms do. In fact, probably a more significant role. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. I do hope to expand and do more of this sort of thing as time goes on, and uh, let me know down in the comments if you think that's a, a good idea or a bad one. And of course if you're interested in this thing, uh, it is actually being sold here at the Rock Island Auction Company. If you'd like to see more about it, their pictures, their detailed description, their price estimate, I know a lot of people are interested in that sort of detail, uh, take a look at their website. You can follow a link in the description text below to ForgottenWeapons.com, and I have a link directly there to their catalogue page on this particular guy where you can find out a bunch more info. Thanks for watching. <laughs>